I'm a little slow this morning for some reason. Shouldn't be because we got the extra hour. But good morning, everybody. Uh, book club number 10. It's November 3rd, 2024. Our first meeting. If you believe it? I was just looking back. Yesterday was November 26th of last year. Mm -hmm. So almost a full year for this group. And uh, we are on the, the final uh, the final part, part five. Um, so uh, as we usually will, you just roll right through it, starting with um, chapter 75, which follows the trial and all the aftermath of the trial kind of continues um, along the theme of aftermath here and kind of showing showing the impact, at least from the FBI's perspective, on how they felt they actually, you know, inhibited the work of the outfit. A um, little uh, short memo there that's from those declassified files. Um, you know, I mean, I guess impact, I don't know if it's completely measurable, but I think the biggest impact is that you know we see coming out of this case is um and we'll, we'll get to it a little bit more in the 80th chapter is the birth of the witness protection program and its impacts on organized crime and kind of the code of silence that was yeah. really yeah. propping it up for so long so yeah. um you know uh kane filed their uh his appeal the co-defendants filed their appeal uh, with the um, Seventh Circuit Appellate Court. And because they were uh, trying to, during the trial, have all of the witnesses come out and, you know, affect the credibility of the other witnesses in Wadur, they said that, you know, Judge Hoffman should have allowed those witnesses to be heard in front of the jury. And I found the appellate court's decision you know, very interesting and it's a really um sort of uh I, I feel like it's very controversial but you know they said stories un unusual the testimony was not inherently incredible the jury was fully informed of the circumstances which bore upon their credibility including the interest in recognition of the government and their cooperation but the jury believed them um and then you know, in each case, defense counsel brought out many facts which might damage credibility of the witnesses. Um, but the court did not ab abuse his discretion in stopping inquiry where he did, or that if there was error, it was harmless. The judgment appealed from the judgments appealed from are affirmed. So, um, you know, of course, you know, they're not taking in part of the whole picture, but I just felt like, you know, harmless being kind of the interesting word there because there's so many other factors in you know uh, uh, victims of these three uh, people you know of course including and you know primarily Terry Silligan you know and so it's just a very uh, it was just very interesting and will kind of be become more of a uh, kind of startling statement when we go through the Chicago 7 trial. You know, before that, um, I really found 75 and 76 to be the worst part of the story because it was just so, like, um, very quick. Uh, okay, let's just wipe the slate clean, get these guys clean. What else do we have to do? Then we have Ogilvy coming in, commuting sentences just boom, 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 boom. And you can just see the fix or something, right? I mean, just cleaning them up and shining them up for witness protection. And I've, I found it extremely, um, you know, awful. Yeah, agreed. Is, yeah, uh... I, I just wanted to chime in. Um... And, and Maggie would know this, uh, harmless error is a legal category. So when they're saying that something is harmless, it, it really not meaning the real harmless. It just means it's not affecting the legal rights of the appellant or the ones convicted. So it really could be 
not harmless. It could be something very serious, but they're called harmless errors is again, a legal term for just things that don't affect the specific procedural uh, rights being brought out by the appellants. So it it's, that's just a, a way that they categorize different pieces of evidence. Well, that's going to become an end note because it's very important. So thank you. <laughs> I'm going to put it in here. Mm -hmm. I will clean this up later and consult with you, but I can't, I don't want to remember. I don't want to forget. Um, And Tom, why don't you put a highlight on that too? Okay. That up with a nice uh, fluorescent <laughs> yellow. Honestly, otherwise I'd forget it if it were mine. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, so that's really, I mean, of course, I'm not like personally saying like, you know, the appellate court is you know being flippant um i think there's it sort of just goes along with the just common theme here that mom you just alluded to that this is all that just kind of seems like you know okay we're good let's let's move along the the action has happened so let's be done with it and then you know going so far as you know saying good luck to you know Patrick Shang and good luck to Michael LaJoy um, when you know the, the kind of criminals that they are is is just like very it's very unsettling that that's kind of the way that our system has become or be and really like became here I think like that's this case is a very interesting sort of like starting point for witness protection uh in Chicago and so like the uh I just just find that very unsettling that of course like it impacted our family in this way but it's interesting to know too that this is the way things work now yeah and you know it, i think the common understanding at least mine up mm -hmm. until this point has been that witness protection was for whistleblower type people um you know but it's seems to be kind of tailor-made for criminal informants yeah. I, yeah it's the deal yeah. with the devil uh-huh yeah it's a good way of saying it because yeah like um gerald Schur, who um you know he referenced in the text is kind yeah. of the architect of the program and he you know in his book i mean he definitely alluded to several cases and was you know up front where there was cooperating witness led to you know someone else being convicted they went into the program and then they continue to commit crimes or violent crimes. You know, it's not like that never happened um, before. So there's definitely collateral damage when you make a deal with the devil like this. Um, that's sort of an inherent, inherently evil part of the program. And it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, reconcile with when it does affect you or when you, when someone is victimized so there's a lot of um there's a lot of um people who have been victims out there of folks who were put on the street who were violent criminals who you know informed on someone else for the greater good or whatever um, you know tom what do you think about and you know maybe i won't even start it like this here's a here's a different way to frame the entire thing is through the witness protection frame which may get a bigger audience um, of saying, what is this? I'm going to look into one instance where early on this was used to, you know, initiate a series of events that became just a major injustice, you know, kind of what else is out there in witness protection? Just, just a sense of, you know, a different way to think of it. I'm not, saying rewrite the whole thing but that it might be a different frame 
yeah no it's a, it's a, a bigger theme for sure at the very least um yeah i think uh another another sort of aspect to this is when in this chapter lajoy is given a new attorney this time a, a public defender by the name of howard kaufman it's a very small detail but actually howard kaufman was the chief of consumer protection at the attorney general's office somebody followed Howard howard kaufman and then the person who followed that person was our dad my dad right. michael so right. my dad actually knew howard kaufman i've met him through you've met dad. howard kaufman mm -hmm. Um, and my, and dad was talking to dad this morning, a little bit about it to refresh my memory. And he was like, yeah, he really wanted to be a judge, like so bad more than anything. And then finally, when he was a judge, um, you know, cause he was trying to get in on the political side and get in with certain people. And then when he was a judge, um, you know, one day he brought me back into chambers and was like, Mike, I hate this job. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my dad also described them as quote a total goof so that was uh interesting uh and another just interesting connection i don't know they just as i said as i've said before in this project they just keep coming and that was another one um that I but found. he got lajoy off on probation and lajoy gave another little rehearsed speech there that don't tell me he wrote that or said that extemporaneously you know you mean you don't think that he meditates? Um, and I... <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, sincerely, you know, whatever, know the wrong I have caused. Now, let me just keep going on. After a year and a half. Right. He's... Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I yeah. thought that was interesting, too, right? It's a lifetime of criminal activity and just a year and a half, everything's just... right. <laughs> right. On. Pretty good deal. Pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. they all want to stay out of jail so much, which is so ironic. It's like, what? What's your occupation? I mean, they like they're overriding principles to stay out of jail no matter what. Um, and yeah. that's what happens when you do this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. what should happen <laughs> i guess mm -hmm. um so this this chapter is uh i spent a lot of time make, writing this as short as i could um because a lot a lot goes on I mean, as mom said from the election results through the commutation of their sentences and so, um, obviously, a big part of all this has been Ed Hanrahan's election for Cook County State's attorney and kind of propping himself up as this, you know, law and order guy in a year where Republicans were running on law and order um, and things were very unstable, unstable. This is interesting. We're talking about this in our election week here, uh, two days before our election. And uh Hanrahan wins to a county state's attorney by 300,000 votes so that's a pretty wide margin as well it's not like he had a tight race and having his name on this case and the press that came out of it put him over the top or anything uh 300,000 votes is 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 pretty high especially in a year where a lot of democrats lost and so you know it certainly could have had an impact um, but I, I, you know, I cannot officially say that it was what put him over the top or made it, you know, made him win so handily. Um, because then in Illinois, if you can even believe it at this point for the Illinois we've lived in, in the last 10 years, um, uh, Republican Richard Ogilvie won, um, against the incumbent Sam Shapiro, um, and became governor. Um, and so, Pretty much right away, I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but um, very soon after Ogilvy took office, Tom Ferran requested a meeting with him to commute, officially commute the state sentences of the uh, unholy three 
D'Argeno, LaJoy, and Shang. And, you know, politics being politics, of course, Ogilvy, you know, was not happy with the way that that trial was brought about and his name was smeared and during the election season. He still commuted the sentences, um, you know, I think, because what choice did he really have in that sense? I don't think he had much of a choice politically, maybe, maybe morally, but politically speaking, especially, um, and from just a, um, you know, in a, in a way of if he's going to be a law and order candidate and there's new, new witness protection program tool at everyone's disposal in the federal government, why would he, you know, would he really want to, you know, immediately push back against that? And um, he didn't. And so not only did Ogilvy become governor, but Nixon became president. And of course, presidents pick um, the U.S. attorneys in uh, different states. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, foreign even or foreign even being a Democrat stayed in that seat um, during the Nixon administration. Um, and part of that uh, was because he agreed to prosecute the Chicago 8 or what became known as the Chicago 7 coming out of the 1968 Democratic National Convention. I just threw a lot of at people, so we might want to stop there questions about that or discussion about that. Kind of, you kind of understand like the, the chronology there. Mm -hmm. So Ogilvy's motives for commuting those sentences is to like credit himself as like I don't really understand that because he did, yeah he he didn't he get didn't that. like he didn't like that they I don't wait sorry explain it oh no it's 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 hard to sort of immediately understand but like if you think about it he's taking office he these witnesses still have their state crimes. And they're trying to put them in witness protection. They've got to like commute those crimes so they don't have to keep coming to court, et cetera. It's a new program. They say, can you commute these so that we can reward LaJoy, D'Argeno, and Shang for testifying and give them a clean slate? So yeah. it was all about so, giving them a clean slate. They already okay. had the commuted their federal sentences. Yeah. And this was their state sentence as well. Okay. So foreign initiated that process and Ogilvy said, all right, but then you you owe me a favor. Yeah, yeah. And who knows if he ever did that favor, but like definitely would have cashed in on something like that and had started, you know, a good relationship with his U.S. attorney from the beginning, which honestly is like a benefit to Ogilvy as yeah. well. To, you know, not immediately have friction with the sitting U.S. attorney um, that Nixon just uh, reappointed. So Okay. Yeah. It has nothing to do with like the conviction of Richard Kane and Ogilvy's relationship to Kane. It doesn't have anything to do with that, really. It really doesn't. The only thing I would say that is, you know, tangential to that is, of course, Kane's trial was, I think, a lot about defaming Ogilvy for the right. election. And he's sort of asked to like look, look, you know past that and just be like hey you know let's let bygones be bygones here okay. so he has to kind of do that for the for what he thinks is the greater good in that moment um and you know does it so there's bigger chips on the table bigger fish to fry um and of course you know there's not a investigation uh that he has to commute right and terry zilligan or anything he has to just commute convictions and there's no conviction or open real case or investigation against these guys for um the sears murder so he is not you know thinking about that as well so. conveniently so for yeah. that yeah okay got it so Thank once you. people go into witness protection they are effectively immune from any further prosecution from anything effectively they disappear and so that's like the hard thing that was you know kind of come to terms with it's like who keeps track of these people 
if something happens, I mean, they do, I think, have to check in. But, I mean, you can't hold them accountable for anything really after that that they've done in their past life. They're a completely different person. Yeah, right. So. So it's like you get the past commuted and the future commuted as well. Yeah, and so like what if, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know if if they get arrested again. Right. Yeah. I, I was wondering about that. I'd like to know that about the witness protection program. Mm-hmm. If you get arrested again under your new identity, no, I, you go to jail under I, that. I think uh, there would be a lot of horse trading going on. If you were in the witness protection program and your name was John Smith and you lived in Wyoming and you were arrested for cattle rustling or something, I imagine there'd be some kind of uh, chips cashed in. But I, I don't think you can just get away with murder, literally. I think it's everything in the past is in exchange for you giving up your um identity okay yeah for sure i mean you can't be held to a different standard plus people who arrested you and charged you wouldn't even know that you're in witness protection really so yeah you would you wouldn't No, have- you know what and i kind of i i was trying to get at something a little different which was things in the past that you hadn't yet been um you know like in in this case this precluded ever um bringing these guys to trial for terry's ki- killing I, I imagine that that could be possible. I don't, I don't have any experience with, with these sort of things. It's all federal prosecutions, but I imagine that would be possible. Anything that you could have done related to your agreement to go into the protection, you'd be immune from. I think you're correct with that. Yeah, that's just, that's, yeah, because what if, you know, something came about later, you know, on LaJoy and DRJ, now that's what you're saying. It's like, oh, well, like they're, you know, we've, match their dna to this where are they at you know what, yeah, what yeah. would you do in that right. Circumstance, right. i feel like you know what they probably would but you know i i don't know then politics would obviously come into play there too right away mm-hmm. right so, right um yeah so speaking of politics well hey i'm sorry to interrupt but maybe that is one thing that kind of makes lieutenant dennis's well, though, no, he was like that before. But I mean, this this like relentless effort to keep, you know, Peanuts Pants go in the center of this. Maybe that's one of the reasons for that. I don't know. You know, you know it, it covers up any kind of possible route to going after those guys for the killing. I don't think that was, I think the peanuts pants go thing, that was like right away. Yeah, you're right. We want to get this guy for something. Yeah. All right, let's try to do this. And then when it, the, I think when the real evidence started showing that maybe it wasn't him. Right. They just didn't like that. And then it became more of a motive to not convict Mm -hmm. because of all of this later. That's at least what what I'm thinking the timeline wise yeah that pro- that probably makes more well, sense a but... lot of motivation to not look into those yeah guys. It, right it's still oh, like a lot of motivation not to look building into. blocks of... big political things at play you know again with dennis was he did he convince himself to kill somebody who you know actually didn't do it that's a big big deal as a human being ready to kill and then later having to maybe accept the idea of maybe having to accept that that person was innocent after all, you know, like the all, a lot of things at play. Um, and, you know, this is the way it ends up. It's like hard to write something that does not, you know, obviously in the real world did not have a good ending. This did not turn out the right way, but what I'm, you know, trying to do is kind of, shine a light on all these different things that played into this and you know part of that just being the corruption and the political system which um yes i guess i work in every day so that's my choice but um you know i think uh on a big uh this was kind of my big uh i don't know i i really had a um i guess like watershed moment with the movie that came out three or four years ago now, it still feels new about um, the trial of the Chicago seven. And if you have not seen it, 
Um, it is really good. Um, I know, you know, that is a famous trial, but I don't think a lot of folks know exactly kind of like what went down with that. Um, Tom Foran is in the movie. He's one of the characters. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays his assistant. Um, I mean, the it's a great cast. And Julius Hoffman is in the movie. And there's a distinct... Frank oh, Langella. Yes, and he's so good as Julius Hoffman. Like, that, that his performance alone as Julius Hoffman is worth watching the movie. So, r- highly recommend a Sunday movie session or it's cold out. You're looking for Borat. Borat plays Abby Hoffman. Yes. Yes. I thought you were I thought you were recommending Borat as well, which would have been really funny. Also, I always, I always try to get a Borat recommendation in <laughs> every conversation I have. <laughs> What's up, Vanilla Face? Uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh <laughs> yeah, it's a very great movie, and there's a distinct parallel between that case and US. V. Dodano. First of all, the convention, the Democratic convention happened in the riots, happened a week before U.S. Dodano started. And then one year later, new presidency, uh, Tom Foran agrees to prosecute the demonstrators. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe this wrong, so cut me off if you have questions. Um, Tom Foran, uh, tries the case, prosecutes the case. And during the trial, the defense tried to bring to the stand the former uh, attorney general, I'm not going to get that wrong, um, Ramsey Clark, because Ramsey Clark's office did not bring the um trial against the defendants in his previous administration because they found that the Chicago Police Department was just as at fault for the riots as the demonstrators were. Ramsey Clark's testimony was heard wider and it was thrown out by um you know Julius Hoffman who said no we can't you can't hear the jury cannot hear the why this case had not been brought before it's irrelevant when the chicago seven were convicted their appeal was based on julius hoffman's inability or um unwillingness to hear ramsey clark's testimony in front of the jury yep. so i probably recognize that very wrong yep. that appeal was successful Richard Kane and his co-defendants appealed on the exact same thing. Yeah. And they they were unsuccessful mm-hmm. in court. So lawyers, what happened? I'm I can't I can't describe anything else. What happened? <laughs> there, see? Yeah. Reading this <laughs> makes me want to read both uh both opinions so I can figure that out because I I don't know. I hate yeah, to think that politics is behind it, but it might be. Yeah, I'd be speculating too of political. I'd have to really read it too to get into it. Maybe uh when we get together, I'll give me some homework. Okay. Okay. Well that's your homework. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have access to those um, explanations of the decisions from the, uh, was it in the text? Um, Like the whole? Not the whole thing, but um, the offer of proof sort of um, rationale is sort of in this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very, like very oh, dense. Yeah. Chapter, so we have same judge. Same- oh, here it is. Yeah. circumstances different outcome yeah but yeah it would be good to just put them side by side and yeah distant or not i didn't realize that i had linked that um in the text but yeah so um 
just yeah, maybe maybe you guys can uh, take a look at those appeals uh, and and you know see if that theory is is correct. That kind of on the same grounds, one appeal was upheld or um, remanded. I'm trying to remember the right terminology, and the other appeal was successful. And so just to recap, the offer of proof for the Kane um, trial was that he was basically bringing out evidence to uh, defame the credibility of LaJoy and D'Argento. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it. Hoffman was like, nope, that's not, you know, like, well, he, he sequestered the jury and then the prosecution gets to you know accept the offer of proof or not and then the judge uphold upholds it and you could see it kind of play out in the courtroom in the trial the chicago trial uh trial of the chicago seven uh where you know the defense is just they just go ballistic when the jury cannot hear ramsey clark's testimony um who michael keaton plays ramsey clark it's just like a one scene cameo where it's just michael keaton it's a great movie um and it's aaron sorkin as well if you like aaron sorkin um check it out has anybody seen it no i'm gonna have to watch that before our next meeting mm -hmm. yeah, I, I saw it but i don't remember i remember it being very interesting but i i don't remember too much more about the things that you're getting at um they didn't stick in my head at the time i was i saw it yeah, it, it, even if you watch just that scene, it's like, um, it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting. So just sitting there watching it, knowing Hoffman's in it, and then I'm putting all these things together in my head. I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. So, um, and then yeah, things don't really end up well for Hoffman after that trial. That's pretty much it for him. Um, we'll get to we'll get to that a little bit, but he's pretty much toast after that trial. Um, which yeah was also very political as well and he was kind of chosen to do the same kind of politically charged um you know public highly publicized trial that he had done the year prior um chief judge was like hoffman can handle this so i don't know if how much the chief judge is able to pick which judge does what but i'm sure that they have some interest in knowing that the judge will be capable of handling the publicity and uh, the emotions and things like that so um it seems like he liked it right oh yeah he loved that I, yeah the, some uh, they were saying that like in some things that i read about hoffman that like he would come off as like oh, i don't really i don't really care for this but then he would like have you know reporters in chambers and things like that and like chat with them and stuff like that and like really loved the the limelight and that was yeah it was the end for for him pretty much yeah. um yeah and then of course you know Kane even after being you know convicted losing his appeal just continues to be Kane and asks Ed Hanrahan to meet with him and gives him some information that's not really relevant but hey when I get out of prison I'm happy to be your uh a double agent again um, just literally telling Hanrahan, Hey, like when I get out, I'm your guy, uh, I'll, you know, be around. So, um, nothing ever really happened with that offer, uh, of course, but, um, just another, um, just another crazy Richard Kane thing, you know, just keeps, he just keeps scratching and clawing to get himself on top and get himself out of messes. Um, so is it? interesting to find that uh and then yeah kane really only spent three years in jail and so um we will get to the end of richard kane at the very end of the text but um once he gets out of jail it's not not very much long after that that goes goes away forever um so you know if you y'all remember like in uh i think part three there were some other robberies that happened in the same time um in 1964 and 65 with shang lajoy diargeno 
and you know some other associates. Um, they robbed uh, traveling jewelry salesman's home. Um, you know, dressed as women went in there, uh, held up their son at gunpoint, and you know got their jewels inside. They're the ones, again, pointing the guns and doing the robbing, but then on the flip side, testifying against the other people that, you know, they were part of the crime. And I think they... you do a really good job of keeping bringing that out. Like, these are the worst actors in these situations, and they're fingering the, the ones who did not act quite as terribly. Yeah, and it, especially like the divine savior. Yeah, right rectory think, robbery think backwards right shouldn't you use the lower guys to get the higher right 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 super yeah. backwards yeah mm -hmm. like where's the where's the like regulation or case law on that not being like something you can do it's just like a free yeah. range like oh we can get people however we want even if it's just ass backwards mm -hmm. right yeah i think maybe that's it yeah can I ask uh, everyone's opinion on something? I was thinking about reading this. Um, do we think that there's some kind of correlation between the start of witness protection and maybe how the outfit or the mob federally is like less prevalent now or less obvious now? Um, do you think? Do we think that that's really like? the way that they finally poked holes in the whole system because before witness protection it was very like yeah if you say anything you die mm -hmm. and it seems like you know and I never realized that it started around the time where you know these witnesses that we're talking about um were sequestered and put in witness protection. It looks like they were some of the first ones. It's cra that's yeah. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. I didn't realize I think, that. I um, think uh, that's addressed in in eighty. The what? The like. That whole question. It's like oh. once 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 witness secure once witness protection started to be a thing, it it broke the whole Omerda thing. Yeah, it, yeah. So I think that that's where I like obviously started thinking you know more holistically about it of why we don't see you know mob activity down the street anymore right could it really be like a big correlation with WITSEC yeah I think it's a really good question or different uh -huh. gangs you know different gangs though yeah. Yeah. different right right and this is the end of the Italian mob yeah. and the right. italian control over uh you know primarily control over the big rackets of course you know there's other ethnic ethnic gangs all over you know the city and everywhere else but the italians became the target of the feds especially and then you know i would argue doing all this research is like this is going to sound bad but it, when the Italians were in control of, you know, the criminal rackets, there was a, a, a hierarchy, right? There was a, like, they had the code, of course, which was really hard to crack, but at least with the hierarchy, a lot of the, you know, big bosses would have relationships with some of the, you know, police. And there was like different, uh, you know, there just structurally it was a lot easier to uh, approach the entire criminal syndicate whereas after i think the disruption of the outfit and the mafia um there were like much you know gangs were much more like proliferated and mm -hmm. spread out and smaller and you have like in chicago now like you have gangs that pop up out of nowhere and they like try to get to the top as quick as they can with like, you know, all these like carjackings and huge crimes and killings. And then they're gone in like three months mm -hmm. and like nothing ever can really happen with that. You know, you can't ever like infiltrate some of these gangs. I mean, there's just, that's a bigger conversation, but interesting. Yeah. Uh, when, when this protection really dismantled um, this kind of like 
the idea of a gang that was the power was consolidated at the top and now i think uh you know criminal power is much more like you know spread out in my opinion and how would you see then so at rico being kind of like the the final nail in the coffin of these big mob enterprises and when when would rico have been established lawyers uh, rico was there by the time i started law school and um so it must have been in the late 70s i'm guessing and the fascinating thing about rico is that all you had to show was a criminal enterprise and then you could bring out the uh testimony of anybody involved in the enterprise enterprise could be used against co-defendants so all these hearsay regu uh, hearsay objections were out the window with rico and it was really very broad um, broad ranging and you could go after you could make an enterprise out of just about anybody getting together to do something bad and then if you brought a rico trial these are federal cases but if you brought a rico trial anything anybody said in that group can be used against everybody so it was very very helpful as far as convicting these um, uh, large groups, these cr criminal enterprises, they were making criminal enterprises out of, you know, not just mobsters, but uh, you know, carjackers and all kinds of things. Hmm. Although it's it's a federal case, so it's it's very expensive um, proceeding. It's not done all the time, but it was very very effective. That's what that's what gave us Rudy Giuliani, right? Oh. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And yeah, just really like Witsec being the sort of downfall of Omerto, which was like pretty much a foolproof system. Like just nobody talked, you know. Um, and just let somebody in here. And Bobby's joining us too. Um, yeah, just... Uh, sort of a larger theme there you know about well you know let's let's think about that in relation to the story that you've told uh here it is a foolproof system perhaps but it also injects this constant paranoia into the system of is somebody ratting is is somebody did you tell on me you know are you really um and maybe not at the top top but all these guys seem to have that constant paranoia about um, their fellow criminals. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sort of like made the outfit really start to think, okay, well, with all these lower level guys, you know, they're a lot more expendable now. They're not, you know, you can't like just think of a gang of robbers. Like they're in, they're in our crew. They're part, they're one of us. I mean, they could flip whenever they yeah. wanted to so yeah yeah and i yeah i think to carlos question too he's a good one it's like they thought that they would have you know maybe 10 a year um mm -hmm. but they started to have one a week Wow. You know? And so it was like probably this like really built up and then everyone was like, well, I got to I got to protect myself. And so, um, you know, really dominoes started to, to fall. So. Um, yeah, it's just really interesting because I always wondered before, like, why isn't it as prevalent anymore? Like what really happened? And um, I just think that, you know, from this text seems like that's what happened witness protection really poked holes yeah and i even recall like a few years ago um one of the strategies to fight crime in chicago that became popular to talk about was to kind of have our own like witness protection or like informant network um that mayor lightfoot was trying to get you know up and running and i don't really know if they proceeded with that but it was also timely just to kind of see that become and i and you know i think a lot of reasons like it is good even though like for this you know in this case no but you know if you have somebody who's willing to inform that's not criminally connected 
and then they would get protected like that's best case scenario and i think that's what they were going for it's like if you if you're in the neighborhood and you really know who's doing these crimes and you want to come forward and like stop that then you know you should be able to do that without you know fear of retribution so uh it's well messy. like my little seventh grade self right what if i had been there with mary allegretti five minutes earlier and seen the shooter that would have been a witness protection situation in the best scenario that you're saying because you know it's it, it i always think of it as for innocent people but it's just not well why don't we get right to that we'll come back to 81 you know so this is uh april 1973 um and i think we talked about this in the book club before mm -hmm. um but it is like just a fascinating thing that you know the Lallies are, you know, completely relocated to, to Galewood on Newland and, you know, down the block is Sam Stefano, mm -hmm. and, you know, gets killed in front and mom, you and Mary witnessed it. So, um, yeah, I think we got there right after the car sped away um, because we, there was no one except the two of us and his dead body. And I remember the arm on the other side of the driveway because we were you know 12 so we were very vocal about it and screaming and laughing and like oh my god you know let's let's get back and tell everybody were you questioned by the police i don't think so i don't think so they probably didn't know you were there I'm yeah guessing. i don't think they did right yeah Crazy. probably was a good thing that you got out of there anyway so yeah. good right? yeah yeah so good but look at you know there's another brush that could have wound up with you know yet another horrific situation with this same group yeah by the time we came back um you know the police were there there was a bucket over the arm that kind of stuff um but in the beginning no and he'd been there the whole time you know that we were we lived there for seven years since 68 so five years already with de stefano across the alley really more uh, near grandma march jim uh, you know they were on the on the corner yeah I, I remember you or terry bringing me over to where this happened but it was very vague and i had other things no I'm kidding really oh yeah somebody showed me the garage you maybe it was you yeah probably or, or terry because it was yeah. kind of a big thing yeah now his wife, my mom used to say his wife, you know, he was physically abused all the time and uh, and worse. And she would run to your grandmother's house for help. Huh. Uh, she didn't. Grandma Marge uh, kept her secrets. She yeah. Had, but, uh, yeah. She did not share that with me. It's interesting to hear that. Yeah. No, I remember my mom saying that on many occasions. Yeah, I would How say crazy this story. Like there's so many like parallel universes coming through <laughs> so, contact and then they spin insane. back out and they spin back together. It's so crazy. <laughs> I know. And then Jim's grandmother lives a couple doors away and is involved yeah. in, you know, yeah. in that whole area. She was a very discreet person. There was oh uh, God, yeah. She did not share really anything about her past. And uh, we to this mm -hmm. day wonder what her husband was like since we really have really? nothing to say about him at all. Uh -huh. I mean, she wow. she was that quiet. Maybe it was just the Irish widow thing, too. Maybe. Well, I do feel like that generation kept it secret. <laughs> yeah. You know, today everyone tells everybody everything. I think that right. everyone was very tight-lipped. Yep. I mean, honestly, I was thinking that with reading this, Tom, like, uh, this is all new to me. Like, you know, I obviously had heard the story of Terry, but never... Never any real details, you know, they just didn't really talk about it. Yeah. Which I understand it's a difficult thing to talk about, but. Well, but then know. it becomes, and, you know, not to jump to your ending here, Tom, and I don't mean to do that, but then it becomes like some kind of mythology in the family. And so that actually, mm -hmm. as soon as that happens, 
then that stops all questioning and it stops all, well, maybe it didn't happen like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Yeah. You know, it's like, it just gets stuck in that yeah. moment. It never right. gets developed or right. thought about right. or at, right. I agree. Like I, this is all just so new to me. Even stuff that happened in our family. Like I didn't completely over my head. I know I was younger, but still. Yeah, no idea. Yeah, I think like, um, you know, Mary and Tom getting together is a nice, you know, thing that unfolded at that time. And having Mora, who's not here, but she's in the this chapter right here, she's mentioned. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like it's just still really hard to see see things like working out because like it's just like nothing really worked out here it's just a very uh it's just very tragic so i'm sorry to bring everybody down no we, no that's actually that. one of the things like for me my experience of it was like what a beautiful thing that mary and tom found each other and got married and then i had another cousin mora and it all just seemed good i had no idea what they went through because they did get married like that was just nothing anyone ever told me so it's such an interest like so thank you for cluing me in on my own family history <laughs> but, and you know well it's, it was it's like they had to go into witness protection <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> i mean tom which kind of sparked this whole thing was tom did a, a documentary on my grandparents and their marriage and their story mm -hmm. so it's called legends of lally I think we've mentioned it in the club before, but it's on YouTube. So you'll, you can see a lot of uh, background from then too. It's really, really, really great. Really well done. And a lot of, and a lot of about Terry is in that because. Yeah. The legends of Lally, yeah. if you guys want to watch it. Yeah. Hi, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Sorry. We <laughs> didn't say hello when you came in. We were in the thick of it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry I'm late. So. No, Thanks awesome. for being here. Thanks for being here. Yeah um yeah I like uh I never heard any I didn't hear a lot from grandma about this unless like a, only when we asked her about that in the filming um but like I just there is kind of like that you know long period of time where she was severely depressed and you know couldn't you know get out of bed and things like that that I know it's just like it's just hard to hard to think about you know just knowing her the way we knew her so well and like just thinking her of that you know also being part of her life is it's just like hard to reconcile but I know you know not for you mom obviously it's you know, it's very impactful and so um just a lot of really hard hard truths here about about uh closure um of course too like i don't want to um this mad sam thing and the stefano thing is not randomly put in as like a uh shocker you know thing either or just a coincidence just want to get back to like the point of including somebody like the stefano in the narrative is because he was the quote king of the juice in the suburbs and juice is like juice loans um and so you know he was a loan shark you know the biggest loan shark in the suburbs and um part of the reason that i think that the sears robbery happened is out of desperation um for revenue and uh I, michael lejoy absolutely had gambling debts at the time um that's proven and there was also, you know, that story of that random oil executive who had um, lo juice loans out at the time of the Gulf Mill Sears robbery, who also robbed a bank, failed miserably. But because that, in March 64, his ju his loans were being collected. So, you know, where was Stefano or uh, other loan sharks putting the squeeze on people who owed them money at the time? Wow. Um, mm -hmm. there's all of that. So that's why I mentioned to Stefano and that's kind mm -hmm. of a, 
So, you know, a theory that's a little bit looser doesn't have as well, much. it's interesting though. It's that did that did that enterprise just constantly inject more crime into the society? Be well, itself was criminal, but did it did it really did it spark one crime after the other? Sorry, Jim, go ahead. No, I was gonna say if you think about it and and what, what Tom's saying, if you can extrapolate it out, if these guys that killed Terry it may not have been just, well, we got we to gotta kill this guy to get away from the crime. It may have been, hey, we're in debt to so-and-so, and we need this money to cover our bad bad juice loans, and it's either kill or be killed. It yep. may add a, a, another element to, to why they were so vicious with Terry in that they saw, hey, if we yep. get caught, we're going to be killed, or maybe our family will suffer repercussions because of bad juice loans, if that's, wow. if that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just think that theory really holds true i like i mean the first thing lajoy did after robbing the franklin park bank robbery was to go to the horse race track i mean and like so i think he was very like a very addicted to gambling and and potentially the others too and so needing money and committing crimes you know is that's a vicious cycle um and just hard to, to look away from the theory. And again, the only reason I even found that uh, article about the oil executive was because I was reading, uh, it's not on my wall here, but an article about Terry and it was on, it was a clipping and it was literally on the back of this very small clipping. So like, I mean, I would never have read it and it was, you know, the same paper, March 64, it was like March 17th or something. I would never have read it and thought about that unless it was like literally right on the back of that small piece of paper. Um, so that's, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, I, I literally wow. couldn't believe that. I just was like, Oh, what else is in the news that the, was in the news at the time? Yeah. Flip over this small news clipping and it's like oil exec everyday man robs a bank because he had loans out from the mafia or the outfit It's like, what? So keep that in mind. It was on the back of what? a small newspaper clipping about Terry from Chicago's American newspaper that I believe was um, Grandpa Z's clipping. Mm. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it was just like, I didn't have the whole newspaper and was filing through. It was just that one clip. So pretty, it's pretty nuts. It sort of makes me wonder if like the outfit didn't want their people to be beholden to a juice man right like that kind of puts them under the pressure to do more crimes for them like i wonder if that's just part of the operation you know like they say with like lawyers right like you join a firm and they entice you to buy this big house and now now you owe all this money and you need all these things so you got to stay at the firm to make that kind of cash like <laughs> maybe it's the same well thought process yep but for the outfit. <laughs> because every crime they commit, the outfit gets a nice break exactly. off the top, right? Right. Like maybe this is the way they feed themselves. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think like just being in that cohort of criminality, like you're exposed to this like completely different lifestyle and you're like borrowing money from people. Right. And, like It's just, yeah. And I'm not going to make the connection to, you know, the, the bar association and the large firms being syndicates too, but <laughs> you guys get it. You said it yourself. Well, if you watch the heard, firm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard it's just like insane like that, but, and just speaking of attorneys and things, this is something I had to include as well, but the money from Sears was drawn oh, yeah. by the attorney administering it and, Papa Tom Lally went in and gave it to the guy, but um, mom, you were still able to use some of that money to go to St. Mary's and meet Bobby. Not meet Bobby, but with Bobby. No, I did. Paid for my first year at St. Mary's, um, but there, the thought was like, oh, there's a trust fund for you kids. There's a trust fund for your kids. And so when they finally went and looked, and you know, they well, never paid any attention to it. My, they never nobody paid attention to it and so the guy you assume people are good right like they're doing this for the i guess you but guys. you know nobody paid any attention by the time they went there there was barely anything left 
And so. what are they administering? That's just gross. And yeah. what did they do in the time period between you asking for it and when it was established? Sure, charged Probably fees that little. nobody ever looked at. Just sitting in an account. But nobody ever did any real work, too, I bet. I mean, how much what were they work doing? is there to do? Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, right. it was some kind of, I don't know what it was. Was it invested or something? I don't know. But, you know, most of it was gone. That's gross. Yeah. So, and then, you know, the Sears had given my mom a lifetime discount that then they reneged on around this time. <laughs> Probably because she was <laughs> like, using it for. I just would love to know. She was probably giving it, extending it to everybody. Like, I'll buy it for you. I got a I discount. That. I hope I everyone think... got new fridges. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone's same reaction to knowing grandma. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> oh, they took that away. Like, oh, like, and I mean, good. I'm glad she did. I'm glad she got away with that for as long as she did. But. Oh man. Oh my god. That's that's very It's funny. so funny. It's so funny. Um So perfect for my OCD was chapter 83 is about 1983. So very just want to throw that in there. Good, very, good. Very, very happy. I don't have OCD, but it it was very 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 good. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh Julius Hoffman passed away July 1st, 1983. Um, I don't think that it's a coincidence that the Patak, Art Patak article came out the same month, July, 1983. Um, and I think that's because once Hoffman died, either that stirred memories in John Shields or John Shields felt that it was appropriate to come forward now that kind of the presiding judge had passed away whatever the case was it i do not think that was a coincidence at all no. this, this case is not talked about for 15 years and then all of a sudden in the same month mm -hmm. uh two major things happen so um uh this another um you know thing about grandmommy that's that's funny was um you know she actually called Art Patak and reamed him out for not letting the family know about the story and wanted to know, you know, his source and whatnot. And that came, you know, to fruition on um, the meeting between family and shields. That's kind of where we'll pick up on the next time. But before then, um, just want to also talk about how really a lot of this all came about and how a lot of things were known later on is because my parents were just sitting um, at the coffee table one day um, on a Saturday morning, not knowing that this article or any of this was happening. And my dad, thank God he read the Sun Times. Um, I already read the New York Times, so I would never have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, just was like shocked to be reading an article about your father's death and investigation. And yeah, yeah. I I don't know if any of the family had actually read that as well, um, but it is shocking that it sort of came about that way mm -hmm. and without knowing about that article. And then later I would, you know, searching for that article over and over again to kind of spearhead to this whole investigation. It just kind of happened just again by coincidence. Yep. So, um, yep. Yeah. Pretty unreal. It's just definitely <clears throat> telling how much information was not given to the family during the Dodano trial and everything because it was probably like a complete shock to the system when grandma me saw that article and probably she probably thought it was all a bunch of lies because yes you're right because she had no context for it whatsoever. yeah it was like right. what is this this is right. ridiculous right and the fact that john shields called mm -hmm right after obviously kind of tells us that he was the source yeah but then also oh, I'm working now um but then also makes me question like why I mean John feels a very stand-up guy maybe very stand-up guy but like why why didn't he call her during the trial or why did why did nobody bring up to the family 
that Terry's name was in, so involved in the Dodano trial. Like, well, really, what happened? what would they have said? They would they would have had to say something like, um, you know, there there's a situation that you know the probable murders of of your son are being, you know, given immunity somehow. I mean, yeah, yeah everybody else thought that they knew yeah. or something. Or nobody wanted to be that person. The one to say it, right? Um, it's just, I don't know. I don't know how they didn't see this in the paper. It, you know, any of the Zilligans, they must have seen it. But maybe the the link to Terry's killing wasn't in I the don't, paper. That was in the paper, right? I don't think so. That was in the trial. But... That wasn't the main focus. I don't think reporters were really focused on that part, which. No, because then the voir dire, it comes back into the. There were a few days, though, during the 68 trial where Terry's name is in the paper. So okay. Weird. And that's like top politics news. Well, you there know. you go. OK. Jim, you're on mute. I don't know if you were talking, but you're on mute. Um. Oh, OK. Uh, so... You know what? It kind of makes me think, too, back to what everybody was saying about that generation that it's in the past. And I think people just were quick to move on and say, well, what are we going to do? And then that was it. And they just didn't go back. Yeah. Or maybe it's like, they don't want to talk about something that's kind of shameful or. Yeah. Yeah. Or, exactly. you know, or painful. Yeah. The yeah. trauma of it. Right. Yeah. Like, my parents never talked, neither one of them have talked about the war. They both lived through it. You know, they, yeah. Anything bad, they really just, they would tell memories. My dad would tell stories of Terry, but never anything about his death. No, no. In happened. fact, there was like almost too Always much of the happened. goofy stories. Yeah. You know, it, it was like, that's all that you heard. Yeah. yeah. And that was the myth making. Right. Yeah. yeah. True. And I think even now we see that with some people we know, like I know you know, for my dad, I think that this is like a painful thing too. And his reaction is like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to re rehash a lot. Well, other family members as well. So, yeah. What'd you say, mom? Other family members too. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's just, you know, it takes, it, it takes a sustained discipline to look back and for its own sake to tell the story. I think a lot of times people think, or must feel like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, if what's gonna, what is it gonna change? Yeah. And if there's anything that that this experience with Tom's uh, manuscript has has really brought home to me, it's as if um, the story itself is the justice, and the truth is the justice. The, it doesn't change a thing that happened, mm -hmm. except that now you know the truth yeah it's a, i think a defense mechanism for a lot of people that's okay. what i was just gonna say i think it's mm -hmm. those are hard feelings to sit with and sometimes i don't think people want to deal with it right so if you just stop talking about it put in the past it's behind me i move on it sounds like a positive thing but i'm not it's always kind of it, terry was always in the room you know so didn't really solve anything. No, no. You know, at the um, 30, <laughs> I believe it was the 30, 33 years out. So in 1997, uh, Michael and I hosted the family to get together um to just everybody we just went everybody got to just say what they remembered and we heard so, so many new things like your dad had so many things to say because he had gone in to see terry's body you know and so he could describe that and you know like nobody we just had never said this is the time to speak So individuals hold their 
so heartbreaking. And we know this, you know, from family life, individuals hold their own stories and their own witness. And it it's only in those moments when they share that people say, oh my gosh, you know, we were, had the same objective experience, but completely different takeaways. I think people are afraid because it's going to hurt, but it actually, you know, I, I think it's therapeutic once you talk yeah. about it. It's like yeah. it's lifted off of you. It's not the burden yeah. that you carry yep. as much. And so, uh, but, but I don't think that generation realized the, the, that talking about it can actually help. That's right. So they just, they just clung to the, you know, you don't tell people your problems kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like it's interesting to talk about how everybody who's like left behind goes through it and processes it. And I think of one of my, you know, driving factors, obviously, you know, mom looking it in into it for you primarily and first, that's how it jumped, you know, to of spearheaded things. But then like thinking about Terry and like if you were the one that died so suddenly like this, wouldn't wouldn't you hope and want that? the people that you love kind of knew everything about it. And then like, I don't know, with all these different coincidences and things just, you know, got me feeling like, you know, I don't know, just things just kept happening that were abnormal. And it just was like, this story just kind of feels like it just had to be told. Um, and I think there's like, yeah, again, some justice in that too, that at least the facts are on the table and whatever people uh, want to take with it, with them is, is up to them. And, you know, certainly like their willingness to engage in it is, you know, completely everybody's choice, but it's also just good to, you know, I think what is a gift to Terry to just like grapple with it a little bit and to understand because like, I can't, you know, if I, you know, any one of us goes out and gets hit by a car, and I hate to say it. It's like, you, you want your, you want people to know kind of what happened, you know, in those last moments. And then afterwards, um, you know, we have the internet now, which is probably why, you know, this was easier to kind of understand all these different facts. You know, they didn't have all this information. They didn't have Twitter for news or you know things like that news alerts um i don't know what i'm really trying to get out here but that's just really been kind of my motivating thing too is to keep a picture up of terry when i do the research um so that you know to remember that he's this is like for him so and i have to say as an aside aside we're, we're all family and loved ones of terry zilligan we all have a deep personal connection but as an aside it's an incredibly fascinating story about how this is all intertwined with all these different figures and all of our pasts or, you know, people that we grew up with. And uh, just to a layman, this would be uh, exhilarating uh, uh, the way this all comes together. And, and you should be commended for, for putting it all in an easy to understand uh, and clear writing style. I, I commend you for that. Yes, does uh, Nancy too. I told Tom he needs to sell it to one of the crime, true crime Oh, yeah. it's going to be a great all oh, those. There's so yeah. much. Yeah. Yep. We got the name of the, what's the one? Dateline type thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm the yeah. producer. Yeah. I want it to be a podcast and then a movie. That's the yeah. so many figures that are in Chicago lore. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. knows these, these gangsters and mm -hmm. even the, the lighter, the lower ones are connected to big mob people. There's a, it's again. It's an incredibly uh, exacting and and uh, interesting story. Aside from the fact that we're all involved personally, mm -hmm. it does read like a movie script because of even the connections. Right? It almost seems like how were you there when the Stefano gets killed? Like that's that's a crazy coincidence. It sounds insane. like made it up insane. for the story, yeah. Yeah. but it's all real. <laughs> it's, it's all real, right? Crazy. <laughs> it's gonna make a great movie one day appreciate the support i definitely want everybody's like true opinions on you know this is obviously a manuscript i have the luxury of putting every detail and end notes and footnotes in it 
but you know how this can reach a broader general audience what you know is the what are the things to focus on i really appreciate that input i have made like a pilot podcast episode that i've shopped around um but it's very hard without an agent or you know marketing people at my disposal to get that out there uh, I do have kind of like my own plan of where I do want this story to go. I will probably just produce it on my own and just continue to grapple with this for many more years to come. But it is a story is like that is worth telling, even if it's, you know, in 2064, you know, it's like you know, 100, you know, 100 years later, this story is worth telling mm-hmm. uh, no matter how I like continue to try to get it out and you also just never know what can happen when this kind of thing is in the mainstream. You know, I guess right. in this chapter, you know, um, with, and people in witness protection usually return to uh, jobs that they did in their past life. So, you know, Michael LaJoy probably, you know, ended up working in a grocery store. Maybe somebody remembers him, you know, by looking at his face later, just things like that can happen. And that's also been a motivator for this. Yeah, is to get it out there and get his you know, space out there too, and kind of figure yeah. out what happened to him. Well, um, you did the hard part by just putting the story down and writing it all down. And now let it evolve. And timing is everything. And I think that it's going to, you know, this is like a timeless story. That's not going to, no one's going to lose interest in yeah, timeless or yeah. something. And no one's going to like get to this story before you do. <laughs> so. Oh no. Oh time. no. It's yeah. painstaking work to put all this together, Tom. It's, and that's the I don't think thing. anybody here, um, as much as we would want to try, we could imagine how intricate this project has been for you. It's it's really amazing, really. Uh, oh, All right, enough with the, enough with the compliment. <laughs> enough, no, it's fantastic. Uh, no, you. and I know I just appreciate you no, all JJ. being here. Ten meetings later, being able to grapple with all of these yeah. things, these themes, and these truths. Hey, um, and Tom, if if you want to call me after this, after all this head swelling stuff, I could I could help bring you down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I'll be right over. Others are four. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm playing. I think so, a great thing would be to find out what happened to John Shields. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, for, through this going out into the wider society. It would be so nice to be able to connect with like his kids or something. Yeah. Because he's, yeah. he's the real hero of the story. Yeah, he really is. You know, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, there's just a lot of vultures, as I call them in the text, uh, encircling this. But Shields is really, you know, one of the 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 real ones, uh, as they say, uh, kind of going through this. He was the only truth seeker, right? Yes. Yeah. Everyone yeah. else is like, well, what's in it to me? How do I how yeah. do I spin this? So it works. So right, Maggie. Yeah. Private sector, away from all the politics. You know, he's like able to just kind of see it. You know. Mm-hmm. See- see it through but um mm-hmm. um and that will kind of leeway segues into the last two chapters and the epilogue which um the chapter 84 will um continue with um uh the conversation that john shields has with the family which is all on tape um have sent the recordings out before i'll send them out again there is a recording that you can just read along with um for chapter 84 um we could also you know think about some that we do that in person together too um if we do decide to kind of meet i'm going to stop the recording now um so we can talk about that um that's a wrap let's see